This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by my stupendous, awesome, legendary supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support Shadowversity on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash Shadowversity. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and the subject of this video is an important one in the series of videos that I've been making about castles. Where I've looked at how castles were invented, the methodology and thought process that happened historically to give rise to these amazing structures, why they were built, which covers the military usefulness and functionality of castles in a historical context, and in this video I'll be sharing how they were actually built, constructed, the techniques they used and the methodology they followed. It needs to be said that this is actually a very large subject because the techniques obviously changed and evolved and advanced throughout the medieval period and then there are the smaller details about the specific tools that were used. Rather I'm going to be speaking in a more general sense to the standard construction principles that you would expect to see within the medieval period. And one of the largest subjects which I'll need to leave for another video is how castles were designed because that is a very big subject in and of itself and of course it's very crucial to to this topic in how castles are built, because the design is going to influence the construction techniques to a large degree. But like I said, that needs to be for another video though, I have mentioned elements of that subject in other videos, for instance principles of castle design, where I give a tour of a castle that I modelled in a 3D program. But we're going to start from the point where they're actually ready to lay the stones in the ground and build this castle. It's already designed and the construction is now underway, how did they go about doing this. Well first of all they needed a lot of money to get the resources and being close to where those resources can be collected is also a fairly important thing. The further the castle is away from say the quarry where the stone is collected increases costs quite significantly. One of the most wonderful things about this subject how castles were built is the grand experimental archaeological project of Gerolon. And in regards to pronunciation I've heard Gordelon and Gerolon but Gerolon seems to be the way it is pronounced by the French so I'll go with that. We are here at Guedelon Castle in Burgundy where we are building a medieval style castle using the same tools, techniques and materials that would have been used in the early 13th century. Guedelon Castle is a project that I have been watching with keen interest for several years now. It is an authentic medieval castle being built in the modern day with medieval techniques and tools and equipment. It is one of my lifelong dreams to visit that castle and I fully intend to in the future. And a lot of the pictures that I'll be showing in castle construction are actually taken from Gerolon because we see the process happening in real time. So if you're interested in this subject please go look up Gerolon Castle, I will leave links in the description below. Now castles in history were generally built out of wood, stone or brick. The type of construction methodology I'm going to be covering is primarily the stone and brick castles because it's difficult to try and figure out how the wooden castles were built because basically none have survived, they were made out of wood. I have made a whole video talking about the prevalence of wooden castles and that there were probably more wood castles than stone castles within the medieval period. It's the video entitled The Castle's Time Forgot. And exploring the possible construction techniques for wood castles is in and of itself its own video. Now in regards to stone and brick castles, stone was generally the more prevalent type, though brick castles certainly existed historically. And we start with the foundations. Now the foundation is important because if you don't have a good foundation, these are heavy structures, okay? They can actually start to sink into the ground. And so one of the first things that they want to do is to dig through the dirt into something more solid, hopefully hitting bedrock. Now when I say hitting bedrock, I do not believe they had the technology to dig hundreds of meters down into the soil to try and find bedrock. No, they would only do that if the bedrock was actually somewhat close to the surface. Better yet, if they were just building on a stone foundation or a hill with a very large kind of rock content within the ground. And if they can't hit bedrock, well then there are other certain techniques that they can try and do to make this building more stable. This is one of the reasons why the bottom of castle walls and towers were flared out. They were a bit bigger in diameter compared to the rest of the building rising up. You see all this building creates pressure on the ground pushing down and the smaller the surface area that this pressure is applied to, the deeper it will push into the ground. So if you can increase the surface area, the footprint that this weight is pressing down on, there is more ground to support it. Alternatively, the flared portion of this foundation could be built under the ground itself. Of course, they would need to dig down 
in a straight line and then fill it in, and the appearance would be that this wall or tower is simply going up in a straight line with no flared base. Of course, whenever you build anything out of stone or brick, you need something to bond those bricks and stones together to make a solid unit. And this is where mortar comes in. Now, medieval mortar was primarily made out of lime, specifically lime baked in a kiln to create quicklime. Quicklime is then mixed with sand and water, which results in a chemical reaction making mortar. This mortar did need to be made in fairly large quantities to build a castle. An interesting thing that I've observed when looking at castle walls is that the surface layer of stone is usually placed with more care and precision together and with less mortar than the stone on the inside. Some of the reasons for this is that the stone facing the outside is the more likely stone to fall off due to erosion, and so placing them tighter together with other stones will help hold them in place. The internal stone structure can't fall outwards. If any part of the stone wall is going to fall off, it's going to be the stone on the outside, and so placing them in a more stable interlocked pattern is very important. In contrast to this, the stone placed inside the surface stones are generally placed more randomly and have a higher mortar content. This is very evident when you look at castle ruins that are suffering from erosion and see the contrast between the surface stone and the internal stone. And in fact, you can also see this on Gidalon. I also think it's a time-saving process as well. If every internal stone was placed as carefully as the surface stones, it would take a lot longer. But with the internal stone, when you have one rock that's not fitting perfectly with the rock underneath it, you can just put more mortar in and fill the gap. Of course, this construction method was only needed on those walls of significant thickness, which basically meant any wall that was facing the outside of the castle, because those were the walls that needed to be thick. Castle walls had to be of this thickness for its defensive value to withstand bombardment, but also stone doesn't really have good insulative properties, and so if you want good insulation on stone, you need a very thick wall, and even then, it's probably still not great. Now, I've actually said the opposite to that in one of my previous videos because I was fed misinformation, which oh, that annoys me, where I said that stone has good insulative properties, and no, it's quite the opposite. One of the ways you can increase the insulative properties of a castle is to line the inside walls with wood. This wasn't done in every instance. In fact, more often than not, the inside walls of castles were whitewashed with a lime-based paint and then painted on top of that with fancy murals and such. This is why castles have the reputation of being cold, damp, and dark, which is largely true because the windows on castles, unless they were facing the inside walls of the bailey, were very small because a window large enough for a person to climb through was a defensive weakness. And the other part to this is that not every castle wall was massively thick, only those walls that were facing the outside. The walls that were facing the inside, for instance, those buildings that were built hugging the curtain wall, oftentimes those walls were as thick as what you would expect to find on a normal stone structure, 30 to 40 centimeters or half a foot. But most walls on medieval castles, this is the walls of the keep and the curtain walls, were at least a meter thick and in many cases even thicker. And because these walls are so thick, a window on a medieval castle wasn't just a window. Most windows were small unless a larger one wouldn't be a defensive weakness, but to fit that window in there needs to be an actual alcove built into the wall itself that's supported by an archway above. Of course, as this stone wall is getting built and is being raised higher, there comes a need for scaffolding to get to that elevation and place the next stone. The scaffolding was made out of temporary timbers and to get the heavier stones up to where they needed to be, medieval timber cranes were constructed to do this. These medieval cranes were powered by humans in large rotating wheels. Another very interesting scaffolding technique that is both used here in Gordelon and we can see evidence of on many medieval castles are a thing called potlug holes. As the castle is being built up, square holes were left in the walls to be able to insert timber beams. And these holes were placed one after another in a line, enabling a platform to be fixed into the wall as it was going up. And the remnants of this necessary scaffolding technique can be seen on castle walls, as I mentioned, by these square holes just sitting there right out on the wall. And the potlug holes on the upper walls were often used to be able to fit in hoardings. Hoardings are additional timber fortifications that can be placed on top of castle walls and taken off. They are kind of the genesis or origin of Mishiki 
regulations, giving a platform for the defenders to be able to stand up over the castle wall and shoot directly down on anyone assaulting the castle wall base. With the height of the castle walls now constructed, we come to the roofs. Of course, the roofs of castles were more often made out of timber. What I mean to say is a timber beam constructed roof with tiles on top. These tiles could be wooden shingles, ceramic tiles, or even slate stone. Slate is a type of stone that shatters in thin kind of sheets and was also used as a roofing material. The way the timber beams of these roofs were supported were by internal corbels. A corbel is a type of stone that protrudes out of a stone wall providing support for something on top. It is through corbelling that supports the extended parapet of castle walls. You know what I'm talking about, people! <laughs> and they also supported not only the roofs of castles, but the intermediate floors, because castles were often very high and had several stories. So you have this really big chunky corbel just sticking outside of the wall, which would support a really big chunky beam, which then is able to support a full floor on itself. These types of internal corbels were also used to support stone ceilings through vaulting. Now a vault, in the architectural sense, is a stone ceiling made through an arch. Stone, brick included, has terrible tensile strength but incredible compressive strength. And an arch is a way in which you can employ stone to span a distance by redirecting the downwards weight that comes to us from gravity into the sides then around the curve into the supports, placing the entire structure under compression instead of tension. And with this you can actually crisscross the arches with one another which evenly distributes the weight into the sides just like a regular arch does to the point that you can actually make fairly complex stone ceilings. But the sides of the main stone supports in these vaults are supported by corbels in walls or just pillars that run all the way down to the ground. This material limitation in the poor tensile strength of both stone and brick is what has created some of the more beautiful elements of medieval stone architectures, the employment of these beautiful arches. This is the same with the use of corbels, but even just making doorways. You see, unless you're making an arch, you can't actually span the top of a door frame with individual bricks because they'll just fall apart and fall down. And so you actually need a solid stone block that spans the whole distance forming the actual frame of the door. And this is how both doors and windows were made on medieval castles. They were made with a full stone frame. Of course, the whole thing wasn't solid stone. It had individual parts, but those individual parts were very large blocks or bricks in and of themselves. And then, of course, we have the very impressive and also complex timber joinery work for the framing of the roof beams and also every other timber component of the castle. And considering the distances in which these wooden framed roofs needed to span, some very impressive timber joinery work was developed to make these timber roofs, specifically timber roof trusses, with king posts, roof beams, principal rafters, struts, and collar ties. And fitting these timbers together in rather complex angles was a genuine feat of engineering and impressive woodworking. You see, nails in the medieval period were much larger than the nails we have in the modern day and rather expensive as a result. Each individual nail needed to be handmade by a blacksmith. Our good friend Nicholas Lloyd from the YouTube channel Lindy Beige has shown us the process of making metal nails the medieval way at a blacksmith in his videos where he's actually learning how to make a sword in the traditional way. Nails are of course much easier to make compared to other things that needed to be made out of metal in the medieval period. But when you need to make several thousand of them, the material cost required and the work involved was so much greater than in the modern day. And it also created a limitation and so much of the timber work that went into medieval construction, including castles, needed to be done through timber joinery work. Fitting these beams together through complex joints and then using nails wherever it was needed. And there we go, this has been the broad overview in how castles were constructed. If you're interested in other significant subjects regarding medieval castles, how they were invented, why they were built, what they were like, I have a whole castle playlist available for you to enjoy at your leisure. And if you want to catch my future videos on castles, as well as my other videos on swords, knights, medieval, anything, fantasy, and how these things are incorporated 
get into pop culture, please remember to subscribe and click the bell notification so you won't miss a video. Thank you very much for watching and I do hope to see you again and until that time, farewell.